All right, we're back with another episode of the Rock Fantasy Files, and we're here in another of our roundtable discussions on album album celebrating milestone anniversaries anniversaries. And on this episode, we feature I got the poster up behind me, The Who, with the iconic Who's Next album, released August fourteenth, nineteen seventy one. Of course, celebrating its 50th anniversary in the year 2021. The album charted at number four on the Billboard Top 200, sold over 3 million copies in the U.S. alone. The track Behind Blue Eyes peaked at number 34 on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart, so it was an AM radio hit at the time. Of course, the track Won't Get Fooled Again has been used on several TV shows and films, and most notably... As of recent years, it's the theme to the CSI Miami series uh, program, which I believe is still going. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't watch a lot of network TV. But uh, anyhow, here's a little bit on the recording of the album. The first session for what became Who's Next was at Mick Jagger's house at Stargraves at the start of April 71 using the Rolling Stones mobile. The backing track of Won't Get Fooled Again was recorded there before the band decided to relocate according recording to Olympic at Glenn John's suggestion, who was a producer on the album. First session was April 9th, attempting the basic take of Bargain. The bulk of the sessions occurred during May with the group recording Time is Passing, Pure and Easy, Love Ain't for Keeping, which had been reworked from a rock track into an acoustic arrangement. Of course, Behind Blue Eyes, The Song is Over, Let's See Action, Barbara O'Reilly. Nicky Hopkins guested on piano while Dave Arbus was invited by <laughs> Moon to play violin on Baba O'Reilly. John, As- John N. Whistle's My Wife was added to the album very late in the sessions, having been originally intended for a solo album. And that's what I've got a little bit about the album that I thought was interesting. And uh, I thought it would be great to sit down and talk about the, this, this album that's been in my life since it's probably in the mid 70s. I didn't have it in the very beginning, but uh, of course heard all the songs on the radio and I'm glad we could sit down here tonight and talk about this great album. I think we'll go in almost the same order as we did on the last episode, if you guys got to check out our Jethro Tull Aqualung episode. But please take a moment to hit subscribe to the channel if you like what we're doing and notifications so you'll know when we're doing new stuff. And uh, I stole a bunch of people from the Sea of Tranquility for this episode, as you can see, if you're a fan of the channel of Pete Pardo. And we've got Denny Barth, who's uh, one of my guys from the Rock Fantasy Files. And we've got two newcomers of Jack, of course, from Sea of Tranquility and his own channel, Jack, which is? All or none, according to Jack. So All right. And then we got Joey that. Spaghetti Lee, uh, second time on the episode. And how, how, you know, why don't we start off a little different? I'm going to start off with Jack, and let you. I'm going to throw you into the fire. All right, no worries. Cool. Uh, already. Uh, so uh, my observations of uh, who's next. That's uh, we were talking about Aqualung previously, but for who's next, that is what I would definitely consider one of my uh, desert island discs. So. If I went to a desert island and I can only, only bring 10 discs with me, okay. this would probably be like number one or two. I love it that much. Um, so an- another little fun fact was that, uh, so after they released uh, Tommy, uh, they were on to their next project, which they called the Lifehouse Project. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, Pete Townsend had some self-doubts about it and he was like in crisis and he didn't know if it would succeed. So he scrapped the project and made it its own regular album, but damn, what an album it is. It, you know, not a bad song on it. No, nope. uh, I mean, I agonize over only picking three, but okay. <laughs> in doing so, I will do that. And uh, uh, my number three is the, so- is the second song which has had some uh, airplay on commercials, Bargain. And it's funny, when, when I, my kids were little, they would hear me play it on the car stereo. I was like, oh, wasn't that from like the Getty commercial or whatever? And I'm like, yeah, now you get to hear the real thing. So that's that. 
Uh, second song, and I love this song because it's like a transition between Pete's vocals and Roger's vocals. The song is over. Excellent. Love, love the piano in the beginning, and then it gets a little heavier, and Roger comes in, and yeah, great tune. Love it. Uh, my last one, and you know, I'm, I try to dig deep into catalogs of bands that I really like, but you, you just you can't not uh, give it its due. Won't get fooled again. I, I love it. Yeah. yeah. What more can be said about it? And I love what he says at the end. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. That's, yeah. been, that's been me in the professional world for the last 30 years or so. Right on. So... That's what I have for the who, but shout out to all every other song on that album. Even my wife, I love it. My wife's excellent. Yeah. 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 But we can always cheat and give our top five if you really want to, or a couple honorable mentions, of course. Whole album. <laughs> <laughs> love Ain't for Keeping's another one. And mm -hmm. and of course, Teenage Wasteland, Bob O'Reilly. So excellent. excellent. So what would you rate the album, my friend? Oh. Thank you, Rick. Yes, uh, if I could go higher than a 9.5, I would. I would say 9.8 out of 10. Okay. It is that damn good. If it's number one on your desert island pick almost, I'd say you better give it a 10. Well, <laughs> you know what? You, you, it's so hard to give anything a perfect 10 because if I think it's a 10, somebody else might not think so. Sure. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> all right thanks jack and we're gonna sure. pop over to the guy that's out in california over here uh ran kelly welcome back thank you thank you uh i appreciate you having me uh steve uh man <laughs> i don't even know where to start with this album because i had only bought one album before this by the who and that was tommy and i did that before i joined the air force and then when i was in the air force this came out and it was like, oh my God, they have put out a perfect album. And I really believe that. And so I'm, I'm gonna change the olds to the rands. And since I have the rands, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and rate it first so I don't forget. I think okay. it's a 10. I don't think the who gets better than this. I've heard everything they've done, except for that brand new one called Who. I haven't really listened to that yet. But uh, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, this is their peak. This is their dark side of the moon. This is their Abbey Road. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just can't, the, the performance and the sound and, 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 and it's historic too, because a lot of people don't really understand the coming of age with electronic music at this point. Pete Townshend got himself an ARP, which stands for Alan R. Perlman, 2600 synthesizer. And he uses it all throughout this album. It's everywhere. And uh, especially on uh, uh, Won't Get Fooled Again. I mean, my God, that is just oh, incredible. But he uses it in Bargain. Bargain starts out with a volume pedal swell on a guitar playing these same notes that later on the ARP 2600 is going to play. And, well, he would uh, also give the technology encouragement for looping. Right, the idea of looping, which will be a trend later on for people who want to practice jamming to themselves. Uh, just the idea he did that with a keyboard, like you said, was yeah. pretty uh, groundbreaking at the time, especially 1971. Right. And Bob, Bob O'Reilly is a Lowry organ running yep. through the 2600 synthesizer, making that, 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 that sound yeah. really fast. So all Pete's doing is just pushing the key down and it's playing like four notes every time he hits the key, like one, two, three, four, really fast. So that's how he gets that. And then, yeah. and then again, I won't, won't get fooled again, does the same thing, but a little different. Not, it doesn't have that. It's, it's going like this, you know, mm. constantly and the loop is longer in the, in the, uh, what do you call it? The interlude where the whole band just goes away and then it's just Pete Townshend on the keyboards by it, by himself. And it's just, it just blew people's minds. In 1971, you know, we were just looking at each other as, how is he doing this? And because, you know, they don't tell you. You don't see ARP 2600 on the back of the record. Nobody's telling you that, you know? So yeah, it's just, anyway, I just wanted to give 
Pete props mm -hmm. just for being creative. He's like, uh, to me, he's like the uh, British Brian Wilson, Pete Townsend. Wow. I just think he's amazing. Pretty high praise. Yeah, him and yeah, and him and Paul McCartney and Brian Wilson kind of up there, the three of them. So yeah, uh, since we can do five, cool. Go for it. You're gonna break break all the rules. <laughs> yeah, break this them. is really this is really pulling apart out here. There's only six of us, so we can do five. Yes, if there's okay. thirteen of us, we do three or. Bob O'Reilly. Wait, wait. I got to go in the order, right? Okay. Uh, hang on. Jeez. Uh, um, come on, come on, think. My Wife, Five. Love this song. Mm -hmm. I think John Hit Whistle just kills on it. And if you're a guitar player and you like to play rhythm, this is a fun song to play because of the chord progression. And, uh, okay. So My Wife. And then um, Bargain, number four. Uh, that's number four. Going Mobile is number three. Love that song. Mm -hmm. the song is over is two and won't get fooled again is one. Awesome. Cool. I love the, the song is over. It's progressive rock. I mean, if I listened to that today like three times and I thought to myself, this is a prog tune mm -hmm. before the term had ever been invented. Pretty adventurous for sure. It's so cool. And you're right, Rick, that the interplay, was it you that said the interplay between uh, Roger Daltrey and Pete Townsend? Oh, that, the voices? that was me. Oh, it was you, Jack? Yeah, Sorry. Oh, Jack. Yeah, that, that, that's amazing. They, they blend out so well when they connect. I mean, sometimes Daltrey can match Pete Townsend, but then he gets into the heavy Daltrey sound, you know, and he, he becomes his own guy. But yeah, that's amazing transitions that they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Behind Blue Eyes is another one. Mm -hmm. I, wanted to, I wanted to mention that, but that gets so much radio airplay. I just thought. Yeah. And that was, I, honestly, uh, I honestly think that Tommy was the album that helped him be a better singer as a band with all that vocal responsibility from the Tommy album. By the time they got to Who Neck, they could kick ass. They're, they're very little. They knew each other's sound. They knew. I mean, like, that was like uh, the training camp, if you will, performing Tommy like that. As a rock opera, th that got you such a maturity level that when it came to who's next, it's gonna sound so awesome like they did. It was well, amazing. they stole Woodstock. I mean, I saw the movie oh, yeah. before yeah. I joined the Air Force, went to the theater, and when 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 the Who came on and they just did basically the ending of you know we're not gonna take it all the way out to the end, and it was just mind blowing performance. We were just like, oh my god, they can do that. <laughs> we we didn't realize they were so heavy. <laughs> they were great live in that era. Great. Oh, yeah. Live in that era. yeah. A lot of great albums from that period, like the Who, Alive at Leeds. Live and at Who, Leeds. Oh, Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight, yeah. And Keith Moon was insane. Oh, I've yeah. never Keith heard Moon. a drummer insane. play like him insane. ever. He was a concert in himself. You're just watching him play. I mean, talk about how dynamic that band. If John Entro didn't anchor himself down, the whole band would be taken off the whole stage, right? Because yeah. Roger He's Dolce and Pete and the moon are just all over the place. It's like amazing to watch. And Keith Moon's always playing fills constantly. Yeah. Oh, constant the vocals constant, and everything. Constant. All over the snare and the tom and everything. <laughs> no other drummer, not even Neil Peart did that. And you know, and you get that in this album too, right? They made sure that you still get their what they're known for on stage in the song now, because a lot of that stuff used to be in the jamming, right? The improvisation or just taking that song to a much higher level. While well, they say now, let's take a live set, so to speak, and put right. it in the album too, if they could, and they did. They definitely incorporated it. Right. I won't get fooled again when Keith Moon comes in at the end after the synthesizer stuff. He is just banging away on the drums. Yeah. This is unbelievable. The song's I'm about ready to too. end, like in about 20 seconds, and he's not letting up. The guy's amazing. I, I mean, yeah. to me, the who without Keith Moon, it just doesn't. Do yeah. Anything. Yeah. And yeah. there have been some great drummers with them, but I didn't really like Kenny Jones too much. But uh, Keith, too Moon, Keith Moon is in like a class all by himself. Oh the, yeah, like how crazy he was and his offstage antics and just his abstract. Just watching, like if you got a you know concert footage or like we're talking about a DVD, just to watch him play, it's just 
an event. And nobody told him no. You know, well, nobody told him. He was, when I'm singing, don't star. play like that. Could he you Could you it. possibly tell him no? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You your car into the pool. <laughs> yeah, he might do that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I but, uh, talking, talking about the Woodstock Festival, yeah, that, that performance there was like, you know, I live right by Bethel Woods, as does Joey. And we live, uh, he's probably even a little bit closer. I am about 40 minutes, you could be at the Woodstock site from my room right now. Wow. And I tell you what, that, that now that they have a regular amphitheater there, but in 1969, they had the heaviest fans at Woodstock. And they stray away from booking heavier acts now. And I'm like, this is the site of Woodstock. You should have, and that, look at how heavy the Who was in 69 or, or Santana. You know, 10 years after. 10 years <laughs> after. Ten years Johnny after. Johnny Winter, That's... you know, just, uh, but I, I mean, the, I'm, I'm real partial to Santana. So I'm going to say that, yeah, the Who stole the show, but Santana was in that race with them that day. Oh, that yeah. Was such a performance by Carl. Well, Santana stole it during the daytime and the Who yeah. played at night. The Who were at nighttime where <laughs> everybody was, no, yeah, yeah, definitely. Night, they were ten, more, 10 years after, ten smoked years after was too. Still 10 out. years after, smoked it would stop. I was going to cool. quit guitar after watching that. Uh, I'm going home. I was like, that, that's it. I'm going. Oh, I can never do that. That guy, that guy blew my mind. But to, yeah, Pete Townsend, that was one of the reasons I wanted to get an SG. And I did, I did get one. Oh, all right. So who wants, who shall we go next to? We still got Rick, Denny, and Joey ready to go, right? I yep. see Joey, Joey's making notes, so I'm not going to go to him next. He heard I know, I'm, good. I'm good. I'm You're good. You're ready to rock? All right, we're going to go to you next. Go. And we'll go Denny, and we'll go Rick, and then I'll wrap things up. All right. All right. Um, this is an absolute perfect, perfect studio album. Perfect. Yeah. It would also be on my Desert Island disc, but I, I, of course, I'd have to bring fifty of them. But this would, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's the Who at their best. Absolutely perfect, perfect album. No duds, no duds. The hardest thing to talk about on this record is to pick favorites. It's perfect. Mm. Um, little known factoid: the scream, Daltry scream, and won't get fooled again, was my favorite ever recorded scream ever until. I heard Henry Rollins scream on a live black flag record really? and that sort of ripped my face off. <laughs> but uh, that Daltry scream is insane. Everything about this album is amazing. It's beautiful. And you know, it's funny. Um, I have my copy. I have an original, probably first pressing, although it's a CD from 1984 MCA. And they do have in the credits, Pete Townsend playing an ARP synthesizer, a VC S3 organ also um guitar vcs3 organ arp synthesizer vocal and piano on baba o'reilly uh for pete townsend and uh this is just an absolutely perfect record absolutely perfect um the who live at leeds the deluxe version is insanely good one of my favorite yeah. if not my favorite live album sort of got that maiden uh i uh uh, Deep Purple Made in Japan and UFO Strangers in the Night and then Who Live at Leeds. Oh, what about the Who Live at Leeds? It's always right there. Always right there. Um, what else could I uh, hey, say? Is. Sir, are we picking uh, a five? I mean, I, look, I picked my pop, top man. three. Like, I'll pick my top like, three. Just like King Kong Bundy in pro wrestling, when he used to count the three, he would hold the guy up and go, <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> well, uh, look, I'll go with number oh, three. It's easier. Three, two, one, and then I'll just throw two more in. All right. Um, but one foot won't won't get fooled again. Again, that scream. It's you know, I mean, what can what can we say about that track? It's just it's killer. It's killer. The sound. You're right for the time for 1971. That was amazing. Um, number two is getting in tune. Getting in tune okay. is so sweet, man. It's Definitely one of my favorite Who tunes ever. And the next one, too, surprisingly, almost a ballad, dare I say. My favorite on this album, Love Ain't For Keeping. I really, really love that song, man. Yeah, I just love the way song. Daltrey sings it. It's a great, great track. Um, I mean, every song on here, man. Uh, Behind Blue Eyes, okay? And uh, the song is over. 
right? If I have to pick five, those two as well. All but right. this is a perfect, perfect record. Absolutely perfect. All I, killer, Jack, no filler. Jack, if, Jack, if you give it a 9.8, what is the point two that you would take away? <laughs> maybe the co- maybe the cover where they're peeing on that. I don't know what that is. Maybe if they were Actually, peeing I thought on that. Was uh, cool too. Okay, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the um the cover is in itself from being lighthouse and then saying who's next is the pretty good sense of humor saying you know yeah, everybody yeah. did their turn but then i also have a double meaning meaning that's our next album you know the title in itself if you didn't see the album cover it is got the like, good sense of humor but at yeah, this point, at this point it's pete townsend's uh um anti-commercialism remember he started dressing like a, in the coveralls and shows because he was tired of being a fashion well he didn't want to have an elaborate co- uh, album cover anymore because he said let the music do its own talking in a way so that's pretty good sense of humor in a way right, right. now look at the cover live at leeds it's as plain as could be just a as plain it could be i have head. some i have live some intel the- on the cover all right okay oh that good I, that i remember from 1971 it was them peeing on the monolith from 2001 Space Odyssey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They well, found, I this, thing. They found this thing somewhere in the ground and decided to go pee on it. Who's next means does anybody else want to pee on the monolith? Right, right. That's what I got um, from that. But next? Yep. That actually isn't isn't urine. They they actually took uh what they uh, film covers. And they filled them with water and they they doused them and to, to make it look like they they actually peed on it. So. Oh my God! There's no Santa Claus either, right, Jack? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to know. I want to know where you took up that fact. That's a good fact. I, I read it somewhere. I. But that's I, uh, no, all, I all, all not Jack, about, according Jack, to Jack. That's Jack, all that's, not that's, according to Jack. <laughs> that's the point. That's the point to you deduct because it's not real urine right there. Okay, it's a nine point eight now because I it's did not know really this. <laughs> my go. heart is broken. <laughs> really pissed on that thing. I actually, I think I may have read it in Wikipedia. Believe it or not, can't believe anything in Wikipedia. It's user driven. I know. <laughs> really? All right. That's so cool. You can't believe yeah. everything you read on the internet. Hey, right. before I forget, can I put in a, about a 20-minute story about Bob O'Reilly? At the very end. Okay, minutes. thanks. 20, 20 minute? Did I say minute? Yes, I got the rant. I meant to say 20 seconds. minute 20-minute 20 20 story. It's a 20, oh, yeah. it's also I meant to say seconds. Do it now. <laughs> oh, okay. How so, many minutes, though? 20 seconds. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so... So I, in like 1980, I was at College of the Redwoods, you know, and I got a little job playing piano in the cafeteria. And wow. they said, uh, they said, yeah, just play whatever you want. It'd be fine. So I'm thinking about Bob O'Reilly and I'm going, dun, dun, dun. and I'm not singing. I'm just doing this. And you know how long that goes. Pete plays it quite a while. The guy that hired me comes up to me and goes, people are complaining because you're playing the chords too many times. <laughs> Play something different. <laughs> Excuse me. So, just, so what you're saying is, even then they had Karens. <laughs> they had what? Karens, people who complain. Oh, critics. No, Karens. We oh, okay. Call them Karens. Oh yeah, I've heard. Uh, yeah, I've heard that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a little slow. Sorry. That's all right. Anyhow. You get close to 70, things start to go away. Hey, I'm, I'm, I got a few more years, but they're going away already now, especially being in this pandemic for two years. It's like pandemic Alzheimer's, I call it. But anyhow, uh, I guess we'll move down to, uh, so we just did Joey, right? You went, yeah. Joey, are you finished? All right. I'm good. I'm good. All right, cool. So now we're going to go to the middle square. I'm going to Denny. Denny's my middle right below me. Hey, man. I'm here, man. (laughs) Um, All right. Uh, Similar to Joey, uh, I agree. Like, this album for me is a 10 out of 10. Um, It's my favorite Who album. um, And I I cannot find any weak spot in it. Like, every song is... And I I think, like, when I look back into what I've learned and, and what I've heard throughout the years like 
I, I, I'm kind of like surprised that this band was able to pull it off because it looks like all four characters was pretty like intense and like able to like, like I, I, I'm pretty sure Pete didn't have as much control over Keith Moon. And, and I'm pretty sure like John Endo still was doing whatever he wanted. And, but like from a musical uh observation like what are like john and whistle as a bass player that guy is like way above a lot of people around that that time and what he does is so unusual and out there like it doesn't make any sense like when you look listen to the bass by itself uh sorry guys i got a bunch of kids that i'm going crazy uh, <laughs> but yeah like when you listen to the bass by itself like uh it always like um, uh, make me think about how advanced he was as a composer and how he was able to like add these tracks over Keynes' complete chaos approach to drumming. <laughs> I don't even think he had a hi hat at that point. I think he had only like crash cymbals or whatever the way he was playing. It was so like percussive and just throwing like noises out there. Um, but definitely, like, uh, that, that's what stands out for me. Um, and the entire songs, all of them are like gems in their own. Uh, they all can stand on their own. And I'm going to go with, like, uh, I, I do have, like, a, a top three songs. And um, number three would be uh, Won't Get Fooled Again. Um, that song, to me, is always, like, one of, like, the best that like, you can... Uh, you can find uh number two would be bargain i think it's one of the heaviest like riff compose type of song for the who i love bargain and the number one song is one of the songs that it's my oldest memories of like remembering music it's going mobile i remember when i was like five six years old driving um uh, from like Montreal to like Boston. My dad was from the Boston area, even though we were French Canadian, he grew up in Connecticut. Um, and we used to drive there like, I don't know, like at least like 40 times a year, I felt like we were driving to like Boston. Um, and that song was playing on the radio. And I asked my parents, like, I want this song. And my parents like figure out who it was and they got me that the who, Who's Next record. Uh, from like my sixth or seventh birthday and like Man. my mom was upset because on the cover it was guys like pissing on something and my dad was like who gives a shit like <laughs> <laughs> the music is good like let the kid have fun with music. yeah so um so that that album is really close to me just because going mobile is one of the first song i ever like remember of on the radio aside like a song by paul mccartney and the wings which was um uh, Emerald Edley, something like that. Then like -na 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 -na. Emerald Halsey. Exactly. Yeah. Like I remember that that melody. So the same thing for going mobile. It kind of hit me right away. And then we went and purchased the record. And that record, who's next? Like uh Side D Purple and Rock. Um and Nazareth, like Razmanaz, one of the first like records I actually own. Uh and to me, it's a perfect end. I, I still listen to it a lot of time and I still think it doesn't get gets as much recognition out there as some of the Zeppelin and Sabbath and then everything that's going on in, in the music uh, world. But uh, I think it's a it can it can stand against most record at one of the best record ever. Um, so that's it. That's my impression on who's next. Excellent. Love, yeah. Love Thomas, I, have, I have a question. Did I hear you correctly that you were six or seven when you got this album gifted to you? That's correct. Yeah, that that's impressive. It's cool. Yeah. I was French Canadian man, open minded people. Wow. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I did uh, get that uh, for my I think it was in 72 when I got it. So I would have been like about six. Okay, I got it. Um, and I listened to the, the shit out of it. I still have it. Actually, in one of my like, uh, I have a locker with all my memorabilia that I don't want to like my kids now to destroy and like whatever do something to it but i still have the the record i bought uh in 72 um and to me like so 
that's why I wanted to do this show because like I, I, I just, that record means more to me than how I can describe to you guys like what I think of the music on it. It just, it hooked me on music mm. and it cool. can't, can't, can't describe more how much it, it means to me. So that's it. Who's next? <laughs> I just realized, I just realized going mobile is about living in a Winnebago. I, I never realized that until today. <laughs> See, I never even knew. I just listen to the song and enjoy it. I every time I do the show with freaking Steven, I'm I'm, I'm learning stuff every time. Yeah, Pete sings uh play the tape machine, uh yeah, cook, cook the toast and tea. You can't do that anywhere but a, a Winnebago or R- just, RV. Just, I, just figured it was part of, I figured it was part of I figured it was like road. part of like touring too, like going from gig to gig and oh yeah, it. definitely, definitely yeah. Hitting the road, man. Just a hippie gypsy. It's cool. It's great. <laughs> hippie gypsy, yeah. He it's says gypsy. Of classic life, rock and roll songs about touring and being on the road, for sure, that many fans have done, you know. But it's great. All right. So who's next? There's a good question here. I guess the only one left is Mr. Rick Levante from Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Well, uh, as everybody been saying, the Who's Next is a, a one of those uh, perfect albums, and it is rated ten out of ten for me because uh, how profound effect on me. And the thing is, I was a, a Who fan prior to that, just from the early British Invasion period time, because my dad used to play that kind of stuff all the time around the house. And I love my generation. I love the kids, all right. I loved all those tunes. I can see for miles, and I always thought that they kick butt as a band back then, especially when you have a bass solo in my generation for the time that was going against the Beatles' help and everything else, that was pretty progressive. Talk about heavy metal. Um, but uh, The Who Next is a masterpiece. I'm already was a fan by... I actually listened in order, even though I'm born 1970 and I didn't get to into this to around 11 or 12, but I... Uh, I would I listened to the albums almost in that order. My dad had the early ones, and my cousin Joe had the Tommy album, and and then I went and got the Who's Next uh, because it was something I didn't have, and I wanted I was on a mission to get more Who. Uh, that's where. And little did I know that it would be the ones I end up hearing all the time in the radio. And I remember dropping the needle on this and saying, wow, this was amazing. Not only sonically and an ear candy moment, because as you guys know, it's a well done album, but you could picture the band pulling this stuff live. At this point in my life, I went and see the movie Kids Are Right, which is a documentary film at a theater in, uh, in my city. It was late night and I remember Without hearing the studio version, there was a great version of them doing Won't Get Fooled Again and that whole light show they had in the oh, video. Yeah. And that made a major <laughs> profound effect on me. Uh, not only because it was a great uh, video moment to see the, any rock and roll show, but uh, they were in the prime, that they were captured in their peak. And that film was there deliberately because they didn't have any historic footage of them doing songs like Babu O'Reilly or Won't Get Field Again. So they actually scheduled uh, a, a shooting to make sure that could get into the film because mm-hmm. at that point, the only thing new was Who Are You and a few other stuff at that time. So anyway, that's come interesting in history. But I love that movie because I saw how wild they are on stage and, and they're larger than life. And then, but you hear that in the record. You do hear that, even though uh, you've heard them do My Generation, you still hear that apply to the music they're performing as you go through that. So I like the album a lot. And then if it didn't get better, they put out, because I mean, I got the vinyl, I got the cassette, and then I got the CD and the other CD, and we master, we master. And then the box de- deluxe version, right? They give you, uh, which is interesting, because someone mentioned, I believe our buddy uh, Spaghetti Lee, Love Ain't For Keeping. Well, it is a version where they're jamming with Leslie West from Mountain on this. You know, it's a nice feature wow. yeah. you hold know that, and then hold, hold that up Rick. yeah oh hold, they could they could did the uh, it's the same album they just just the deluxe uh cover when they okay, have, I, have the, the, the i see yeah I'm yeah, gonna, I, yeah so, I have like the live it leads like that 
I gotta get that. Yeah, and then yeah, exactly. I have that too. That's one of my favorite, like you said. But the uh, the this too is a live concert that they were actually thinking about performing on the Lighthouse show of, and and they captured that at the Young Vic, and it has some of those songs. And what also they threw on this bonus uh, a disc is around that time another song that could have been on the album, which would again wouldn't be a filler by any stretch of imagination, is Let's See Action. Which is another great tune uh, that they were kicking around at that time. And Pure and Easy, which is a piece of that song, is in The Song Is Over. And so they, instead of using it twice, they just dropped that song from the album. But it has the same passage of music that was done in there. And you wouldn't know about it because in 1974, they actually put out an album of leftover material, Arjun Saj or whatever, something mm. like that. And that was. First time I'd ever feature there, but then they came out in the deluxe package. They threw everything in it, including the kitchen sink. So anyway, uh, my five songs, well, my three songs when I originally came, that was hard enough. It's amazing. Eh? We struggle over nine songs on here. That should be a little easier. We get to pick five, and I'm still struggling. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's no know, dots. No dots. You know, so oh. it goes to show you the, ma the material. So uh, one of the things I could also say, I saw the Who a lot in concert and it never seems to amaze me uh to see him pull off any of the tunes okay so i'll go with the three and i'll go the other two as honorable mention um i was gonna say bar uh, bargain uh number three for sure uh mm -hmm. i love that song it was always a big deal and i love how like even like in babble rally they trade vocal responsibility come out adultery and then at last one and one me two you know you know the song so that part's awesome it's like a they go from bombastic and then they go so delicate at the same time for the who style of course uh and then i would go um gee this is so hard because like if did when i first got the album i probably would have said babo alley blue uh, behind blue eyes the obvious one but now the deep cuts are like one of my favorite things because you've heard it so much live or heard it on the radio enough i would go number two uh love ain't for keeping and number one would still be won't get fooled again because of mm -hmm. that imagery i've heard from that movie the kids are all right the other two honorable mention would be uh um definitely you gotta throw in the song is over and behind blue eyes it is a masterpiece to mm -hmm. think they did all that in the three minutes and 41 seconds look how much that song went through of so much emotion and passion and and uh, and yeah, it's an incredible delivery by everybody in this band. The what you guys said earlier, everybody stands out. Uh, everybody brings their A game to the table, and it was captured all in what was it, 46 minutes, whatever the length of the album. Incredible. So definitely 10 out of 10 for me. And uh, and I'm not saying that they didn't match some of that power with Quadnifinia and some brilliant stuff they done since that. But this was like rush moving pictures. They could real peak. They could like the stick grand illusion. It's like they do do great stuff. But this was the finest hour. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. I'd like to piggyback on what Denny said about uh, uh, John Entwistle's bass playing. That was Chris Squire's favorite player. What does that tell you? Fingers. <laughs> if if Chris Squire thinks you're like a good player, like I think you deserve to be you <laughs> player. You know, you know, on that song, uh, on that song, uh, release, release on Tormato, he plays oh. against some Thunderbird, just like uh, John at Whistle owned. It was a reverse Thunderbird. Yeah, the only difference is with yes, I never knew who was playing keyboard, guitar, or bass. I would get confused and trying to like listen to the record and pick up with out of the vinyl. I was like, okay, where did the guitar go? Where did the yeah. bass go? Like, <laughs> at least with 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 the Who, I think it was a more a bit more uh, easier to pick them oh, apart. Oh yeah, that's like forget about it. Four guys opposed to five. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't I didn't know that uh, Chris Squire was a John was, but I I totally oh, he loved the, him. Him and he loved. Well, I don't want to get too off this, the page here, but I will say real quick though, uh, the guitar sound on this album is incredible. It's because Pete's playing a Gretsch guitar that Joe Walsh gave him. Oh, wow, that's cool. I learned that back. Joe in Walsh. Joe Walsh is everywhere. Joe Walsh is Walsh yeah, everywhere. He, he's Ringo's brother-in-law, and he just pops up at the weirdest places, right? 
Joe he's Walsh. so he's so he cannot be cooler than Joe Walsh. Well, think about this: he's Ringo's yeah. brother-in-law, and Ringo's son <laughs> played drums for the Who for how many years? Zach Starkey. <laughs> yeah. There's your, there's your there's connection. A, Joe Anybody Walsh got Tommy that? Bolin into the James Gang. Yeah. <laughs> Well, on the subject of uh, Joe Walsh, did anybody see the Eagles documentary that uh, first came out on Showtime? No, I didn't. It, it, it made it to disc, but it, to me, that's the best documentary of any rock band. And uh, when they get to Joe Walsh, he talks about Keith Moon and, and, uh -huh. and, and, and in his own way, he's like, oh, he decided that he liked me. And then they started going into all these, these wonderful stories about uh -huh. And they're saying how you know all his stories of room trash were all true. Hmm. Oh, oh yeah, boy. And, and Johnny no, Whistle we... and Joe Walsh made an album together, right? Too late the hero. Uh, well, one we, could do a, we could do a whole show on Keith Moon stories, man. I mean, yeah, well, hey, I'll, have to, I'll have to come back in a couple weeks on that one. Yeah. Two sides yeah. of the moon. He definitely was a rock star. Well, one other thing we can mention about the Who's Next was that album made it hard for them to deliver that song live as a four-piece from that day forward. They would end up bringing um, tape machines in the beginning. That was tough to work with. And then they bring a guy that actually played keyboard and Eddie Rabbit and would be the guy for the most, most of the years. But that would end up being part of the, the makeup because that... The, the complexity of the songs in this uh, stage of the who required they have to bring somebody on stage from here on yeah, out. That is, that is something to be said about that what this record did, you know, for them. Sure, sure. Well, anyhow, I guess uh, I ought to throw my picks in there and start to wrap this episode up. I think this episode's been a ton of fun. I hope right everyone on. else enjoyed it as much as I think we're all enjoying because we're all smiling. So, uh, I guess uh, I'll go with the, the three I had written down originally. I was trying to go a little deeper on the album, but uh, I love Bargain. Bargain, it's always been such a great song. Yeah, I just love that how the, how the song's set up. And, and Going Mobile was my number two. My Wife, another great song. I, I had that down as three. But, I mean, how do I really go against We'll get fooled again at Bob O'Reilly. That should really be one or two, even though they're kind of played out. I tried to go a little more obscure, but those are my five. And like you said, everyone else has been saying, this album's a 10. I call it a 10. And I think that it's just a pretty much perfect classic rock album and 50 years old, you know, this year. And the only Who album I may find a little bit more enticing i love tommy i love quadrophenia too though me too yeah. those are my probably yeah. top three albums from them and uh you know of course live at leeds you'll throw in there too but i'm thinking more of course i'm a pinball guy so how do you go against tommy i can listen to tommy <laughs> and i just love tommy you know i've seen roger daltrey do the tommy by himself a couple of years ago at the woodstock site at bethel woods it was the first time that Roger Daltrey had ever gone back to Bethel to uh, the Woodstock site, and he, oh. he, the he who did, did it? The, the who did it at Madison Square Garden with um, they did. Billy Idol? Yeah, I was I saw that. You saw that one? I I just had yeah. saw Daltrey solo, and I I was wearing a shirt a couple of days ago actually when he came back to Bethel Woods, and it was his first time back there in many many years back to that site. Mm -hmm. you know? That's cool. So, uh, I guess uh, I'd like to kind of start to wrap this episode up, but it's been a blast. And I'd like to thank everyone, Rand and Rick and Denny and Joey and Jack for uh, making this all possible tonight. And I hope that we can all get back here again soon and talk oh, about I love it. I'm always, I'm always I love available. this stuff. Great Definitely. Music. Me, me too, man. Always available anytime, anywhere, anybody. Uh, hit well, me up. I love doing this. The Rock Fantasy Files is going to look back on the year 2021 because we'll be in 2022 by then. And we're going to talk about our favorite records of 2021. And we'll probably have an all star case cast. And hopefully, I'll have enough people where I'll knock it in to maybe two episodes. It'll be basically more on, you know, whatever we listened to last year. It's going to be more of a metal episode of course i've got my top 40 records 
and I just did a top 10 on Pete Pardo's uh, Hudson Valley Squares the other night. But that could switch around a little bit. But uh, so we got plenty of things going on, and I'm back in the bunker here in Middletown, New York. I call it the bunker, and I've been in the bunker for almost two years, and it's crazy out there now, so I'm staying in the bunker. <laughs> And I got a hockey tooth smile because I had an accident. So if anybody's looking at me and said, hey, Keeler, fix your teeth. I'm trying, but. Uh, you got a fuck, you got a fuck <laughs> in the face, right? You got a fuck got a in, punch the in the face. Right? By Jimmy Barth. We were arguing about what the best, who's next song. And I saw him the other day. <laughs> oh, no, it's not that one. <laughs> got a few beers too, but. Uh... <laughs> you can say you're pulling a Gretzky. <laughs> yeah, I'm playing some hockey, Gretzky. Oh, I'm a Bro Dora fan, so. I don't know much about hockey. I'm Gretzky's a devil fan. Bobby you know, like, Hall, that's it. I don't even know. Hey, nothing Bobby nothing Hall. wrong with Bobby Hall. Nothing <laughs> wrong with Bobby Hall. I've got that's all I know. Bobby Dystrom guy here. I, got I used a Bobby to watch Orr. Wide World of Sports. <laughs> I got a Bobby Orr's power play pinball machine. So. Anyhow. Uh, so, can uh, I add something real quick uh, to Rick's uh, movie, The Kids Are All Right? The best scene in that movie is when Daltrey's screaming and Pete Townsend is sliding on both knees towards the camera. Best yeah. video yeah. ever. Great, great visual right there, yeah. I oh. bought that. I saw it back then and I bought it as, as the DVD. It's, it's awesome. Now that I'm thinking of something that Joey said, he said that Daltrey's scream was the best thing he heard. And I thought for sure you were going to say Ian Gillen on Child in Time. Oh, that yeah. Well, there you go. But this, it, that one yeah. bell, I mean, as a kid, when I heard that, it was just yeah, the yeah, insane yeah, thing. Definitely. Now it's everywhere. And uh, until, like I said, until I heard Henry Rollins and Henry Rollins scream just yeah. blew my, blew my, <laughs> melted my face Ian, on a live Ian black Gillen, flag record. Ian Gillen on Born Again's got some pretty good belches out there, too. <laughs> I love that album. Well, Child in Time. Album. All righty, guys. Operatic. Operatic. So, so take a moment and subscribe. Mention the viewers if you're still watching, please mention your favorite um, moments from Who's Next in the comments and uh, stay strong. Happy New Year. Happy everybody. New Year, everybody. Happy New and, Year. Uh, we'll see you uh, very soon. I need a thousand subscribers. If you see my video, please help me. All right, thousand subscribers. Mm -hmm. We need a thousand. We need a thousand for Joey, a thousand for Jack. Happy New Year. I want to start my own channel. Good. <laughs> and a thousand people to buy aggression merchandise from Danny Park. <laughs> yeah, and, and buy records from Rock Fantasy. Oh, thank you. A great nice. idea. <laughs> no problem.